Hey everybody, welcome back to another video. Today we're doing a little bit of maintenance on this NES. I actually restored this console about a year ago shortly before I started this channel. It's in excellent condition and it works flawlessly. With the exception of a minor video issue. Let's take a look at what we're dealing with. This is the original NES power supply. It outputs 9 volts AC. Once the console starts up, you can see the video issue that I was alluding to. There are wavy lines running across the screen. Doesn't matter what game you're playing or what TV you're using, the lines are always there. And the reason this happens is because of faulty capacitors, specifically the ones inside the NES's power module. Now, there is a bit of a hack that seemingly resolves this issue. And that's to use a DC power supply instead of the AC power supply that came with the NES. Here I have an aftermarket 9 volt DC power supply. Let's see what the picture looks like. The video looks very crisp. That's what it's supposed to look like. And you're probably thinking, well, problem solved. The issue is with the original power supply. And you might be wondering, well, the original power supply is AC. How's it working with a DC power supply? There is actually nothing wrong with the original power supply. But the true cause of this issue is masked by using a DC power supply. We'll talk about that in more detail a little bit later in the video. All right, let's tear down this console and remove all the electrolytic caps. We'll measure the true values of the capacitors using a component tester and see if they're actually working within their advertised specifications. And while we have the board naked, we'll use that opportunity to swap out all the caps with high quality replacements. There are only three capacitors on the main board, so let's mark those and get ready to remove them. Well, looks like the tip of my desoldering iron is too small to fit over the legs of the power RF module. Nothing a good solder wick can't handle. And a short while later, everything's almost free. Looks like there's just one or two pins hanging on by a thread. And she's out. But not without ripping a pad along with it. Oh well, wouldn't be the first time I've done something like that. 
let's clean it up and take a closer look. And there goes the whole pad. Fantastic. Alright, we'll deal with that later. Let's finish swapping out these caps. Alright, we have six capacitors in here. Five clusters together on the top left and a small one on the bottom right. This module soldered all the way around to ground it to the housing. I'm not going to bother taking it off. I think I can get to all the caps I need to just fine. And this is a bit of a strange observation, but honest to god guys, when I put heat on this power board, it smells like fish. I'm not even remotely exaggerating. This thing smells like I just gutted a fish open. Alright, all the capacitors are out. Let's short them across the leads, make sure they're drained, and then measure them and see what they read. This is an inexpensive component tester. While it's not a precision instrument, it's a really practical and useful gadget for the hobbyist. I'll talk more about this guy in a future video. First one's 2200 microfarads. That's reading 2325. The ESR is very low, which is good. All right, let's try this one. This one's 100 microfarads. This one's way out of range. That's reading almost 50% higher than it should. And the ESR is 0.15 kilo ohms, 150 ohms. That should be one or two ohms. That was probably the biggest offender. All the others measured closer to their spec, but quite a few ESRs were higher than they should be. When it comes to the ESR, based on my rudimentary understanding, when a capacitor goes bad, it's often the ESR that's out of spec, not the capacitance. So a capacitor can still store the same amount of energy, but it charges and discharges at a much slower rate. So while it can store the energy, it can't deliver it as quickly. This one's another example of that. This one's one microfarad or 1000 nanofarads, and the ESR is over seven ohms. This capacitor should have an ESR less than one ohm. There are a couple of capacitors here that are practically toast. I think this is going to explain the video issues that we're having. Now, why did those wavy lines go away when we used the DC power supply? My best guess is that there's less circuitry involved in filtering an already clean DC signal, and you're probably just lucky for a period of time where the capacitors are half working and they don't have too much trouble filtering that DC signal. And the reason the NES doesn't care whether you give it AC or DC power, that's because it has a bridge rectifier, which is those four diodes sitting right behind the power jack. Normally that's circuitry that would be inside a power supply, but the NES has that built in. So not only could you give it DC, but it also doesn't care about the polarity either. Just checking my work, one solder bridge to clear up. Adding a little bit of flux in, going over it with the iron a few times should clear it right up.
Now I need to find the cleanest way to fix this rip pad. First, let me confirm where the trace goes and then see if there's a closer via I can use to build the connection. I think I'm just going to repair the trace right here on the back side of the board. Let me get the power and RF module soldered back in and then I'll work on repairing that trace. I think that turned out alright, I'm happy with that. Here's that original power supply again, let's hook it up and test everything out. Well guys, that was certainly a fun project. The NES is coming up on 35 years of age. Those capacitors were probably overdue for replacement. And if it's not your cup of tea, you can spend $10 on a DC power supply and get more life out of it. But I'd rather spend $10 on a capacitor kit and just have some fun with it. I'd normally say, see you guys next week, but I'm gonna be tinkering in my garage for the next couple of weeks. Working on these retro consoles is my favorite thing to do, but I do tinker with other things in my spare time and I'm getting that itch to get my hands dirty. If I work on anything interesting, I'll consider taking you guys along for the ride, but I know you guys are repair junkies and I wanna make sure my content stays relevant. Well guys, take care and see you soon.